Good morning. Afternoon. <laughs> Welcome to the Entrepreneurship <laughs> Forum today. I, uh, I want to introduce a very good friend of mine who, uh, he has a 72-year-old body and I have a 70-year-old body, and we have 19-year-old <laughs> attitudes. <laughs> and um, uh, <clears throat> Dick Jaffe is an excellent skier, an excellent golfer, and he's learning to become an excellent fisherman. And um, he's someone who I, uh, who I enjoy his company very much. He was with the University of Utah Hospital. He got his um, medical degree from the University of Washington, played on the uh, golf team at the University of Washington, and um, came to live in Utah because this is a great environment. This is a great outdoors, and um, he, uh, he enjoys it thoroughly. He's now retired and, um, and playing, but uh, still very, very sharp. The thing, that, the thing that I think you'll get from him is, is an attitude and the ability to focus. And, um, and, he'll dem and he'll talk about how determination can get you where you need to be. Plus, he's going to talk about opportunities in the medical field. And so without uh, any further introduction, I'm going to introduce my good friend, Dick Jaffe. Right, thank, you. thank you. Is this on? Can you all hear me? Can you hear me, Don, in the back? You can hear okay? I must have fallen a notch in uh, Rick's uh, mind because he called me a very good fisherman last time. Now I'm only a good fisherman. Oh. But, <laughs> <laughs> but um, thanks again for inviting me. I must say this is probably my fourth or fifth time here. The first time uh, uh, Rick asked me to uh, speak, I said, God, this is just like a pig looking at a wristwatch here. I can do these for you. No, it's okay. I'll just right, I'll do ahead. that. We'll just right. kind of keep this uh, casual here. As um, Rick mentioned I am a retired uh, pediatric radiologist and so here I am at the community college uh, uh, talking about entrepreneurship and uh, I, I must say that uh, it caused me uh, to uh, uh, seek help from my uh, sons and um, we'll come back to that. I, my talk is divided into three sections. Brief, just a little history of where I'm coming from. Two, as Rick mentioned, the opportunities in the medical profession. And three, how are you going to uh, survive this jungle and move ahead? And that's where the predominant focus will be. As Rick mentioned, uh, my wife and I came here from uh, Seattle in 1973 after I'd done a, a year teaching in uh, Kuala Lumpur, uh, Malaysia. I started off at the University Hospital and after, because of uh, unique skill sets, uh, which we'll uh, talk about, uh, was asked to join the staff of the Children's Hospital where I practiced from uh, 78 uh, to my retirement in 03. We have uh, two sons. One's, uh, my youngest son is uh, 42, uh, is an investment banker doing mergers, acquisitions, venture capital in uh, Seattle, a graduate of uh, Washington University, Olin School of Finance, worked four years for Price Waterhouse, uh, which may have some relevance to this uh, audience, and then uh, uh, went to Wharton and then uh, in anticipation of his marriage to a Westerner moved to Seattle where he now resides. My oldest son uh, went to Brown, uh, did not like uh, pre-med uh, or engineering, uh, became a graphic artist and now is living his uh, dream life. He's a baseball writer for Sports Illustrated which started off as a hobby. So um, you can find him under uh, the strike zone by Jay Jaffe if for those baseball nuts. He deals in sabermetrics, which is the statistical aspect of baseball. So the second portion I'd like to talk to you about is uh, aspects of, uh, of uh, what it takes to become a physician or in the paramedically related uh, fields that I know of that relate to uh, my specialty radiology. Uh, all of this basically the requirements are uh, on the website for those who are interested. Uh, I must say that these name tags are kind of uh, of uh, worrisome, it means you can't fall asleep in class <laughs> without something. I always learned to keep uh, individuals awake and I would call them, 
upon them just as they started falling from their seat. Uh, uh, but uh, now this is easier with the names. So let's talk about what it takes to become a radiologist and then other aspects paramedically. Uh, um, so the radiology requirements today, uh, obviously you need a college degree, preferably a Bachelor of Science. Although uh, when we get talking about unique skill sets, I will tell you that almost all colleges now are looking for unique individuals, whether they come from sociology, Renaissance literature, whatever. You need a degree, and the more unique it is, your better the chances of acceptance. You need to pass the medical college aptitude test, which is very similar to the LSATs, which relate to law school, etc. Medical school generally is four years for medical degree. Some take five to a year of research. To become a radiologist, you need four years of diagnostic radiology. And then if you want to become a subspecialist, you can see you need some additional training. So by the, time, by the time that you're finished, you're in your late 20s or 30s, and unfortunately, when I say it's unfortunately, you are probably $100,000 in debt, <coughs> barring scholarships or working. And, and almost all of you are going to have to work as I did, and this will result in some real time commitments. The practice, once you've done that, is generally at an affiliated children's hospital, which is a big city. You're not going to be practicing in Vernal. You're going to be practicing in Portland, Seattle, Denver. That's become a radiologist. And once you've succeeded and passed all those hurdles, then you can practice like I do it just prior to my retirement. Put your feet up on the desk. You can talk to the doctor on the phone and dictaphone and read right off the CT scanner. Okay, well, let's not worry about becoming a radiologist. What does it take to become a technologist? A radiology technologist, also known as radiographers, provide patient services uh, for uh, radiologists uh, using imaging modalities at the request of physicians. He or she performs radiographic procedures. You need to know principles of radiation protection. You look for the radiographs where they're appropriate technical quality. You need to utilize your professional judgment and you provide patient care and empathy. Radiographers can find employment in hospitals, clinics, private offices, industry, and public health facilities. I will tell you that my practice changed considerably. In 1973, when I started to deal with children, until about the 90s, I dealt almost exclusively with children. That was not the case the last 15 to 20 years. It was the mothers. I don't want you to denigrate the fathers, but the mothers required more care than the children. They were the primary caregivers. And what happened is the internet became prevalent in the care. And Mrs. Jones would come to me with a stack of papers from the internet and say, Dr. Jaffe, I read this on the internet. Can you do this? Well, the beauty of this was that she was correct. She often knew more than I did about certain rare diseases. But the problem was that she may have pulled an article off the internet from, from Denmark or uh, Japan, and we did not have the medicines or the technique or the instruments to do that. And it took more time to talk to the mother than it took to treat the patient. And so I had to undergo a learning curve about how to, to become more empathetic with mothers and fathers. I don't, as I said, I don't mean to denigrate the fathers, but 90% was were the mothers. So the internet completely started to change my practice, as well as it provided an opportunity for me to consult with my physician colleagues wherever they were around the world. And we can send x-rays now uh, digitally, just like you can send your picture on Facebook or whatever around the country. Your x-ray today, taken at night when you bonk your head, can be read in Bangladesh at about 1 20th the price. And it can be sent back here, and the bill can be sent from New Delhi at the same thing. So it's an internet age today. So to become a technologist, what do you need? There's the internet uh, site for the requirements. We'll touch on that. Training is uh, here at the community college. Uh, the training is also possible at Weber State with multiple outreach programs, and I just uh, checked them. They're expanding, but the biggest one is in Provo. So if you're at the Salt Lake Community College, what does it take to become uh, a radiology technologist? Those are the requirements, math 1010 with a C or better, English, C or better, 
biology B minus or better within the past five years. And then there's the RAD 1010 introduction to radiology. That's all on the website, just to give you an idea of what's cooking. So successful completion of the program requirements leads to what's called an Associate of Applied Science degree. And this is an accredited program. Unfortunately, as you work your way up, everything requires testing and accreditation. Compensation. Generally speaking, and I just checked on this, you start at about 25K, and with seniority and experience, you can work your way up uh, as high as 75 and even $100,000. You're probably going to need some type of additional training, uh, like a master's degree, uh, to become uh, uh, involved in uh, heading a department or like Intermountain Medical Care. Uh, always has senior individuals who are involved in training and uh, upkeep. Advanced training, uh, magnetic resonance imaging and CT are, are at least uh, uh, very well compensated. Okay, you can become even more advanced with more training as uh, uh, the woman who worked with me for 16 years. Uh, you obtain what's called an RPA, Radiology Practitioner Assistant or Radiologist Assistant. You need three years of experience as a registered technologist, so you have to be in the field working. You need a recommendation from individuals such as myself and a healthcare facility which will allow you to complete the clinical requirements of the uh, program, and that particularly uh, is at Weber. I don't think it's here, it's mostly at Weber. An RPA is a health professional certified and registered as a radiographer and is credentialed to provide primary radiological health care services with a physician supervisor. And if you have a master's degree, you can bill and you are very valuable. If you don't have a master's degree, the government says you can't bill and it's diff more difficult to uh, establish your uh, worth. So the dear old government's in there. Okay, here's some websites uh, to, uh, to learn if you want more adv advanced training. And it's kind of difficult, I'm sure, sitting here worrying about where your lunch is to be thinking about five, seven, eight years down the road. But there are websites and they're easy to obtain on the internet. I'll leave that up for those of you who might be interested in copying that. Actually, this is recorded and will be available for them, is that not? Thank you. Okay, so here's the Weber State requirements to become an RPA. Three years experience, as I mentioned, as a technologist. You need advanced life support certification, how to do CPR in the middle of the highway. You need a Bachelor of Science degree. And you need five semesters of class with 20 morning sessions at Weber State and online classes that are available around the state. Ultrasonography. Ultrasonographers uh, can get their training at Weber State and Dixie State College. And there's the requirements at Weber State. Associate, bachelor's, and master's degree. You need first an associate degree in applied uh, science in radiologic technology. So you have to become a technologist first, and then you can become an ultrasonographer. Then certification, as mentioned. Okay, you can pursue either the medical track or a cardiac track. The medical track includes uh, such areas as abdominal sonography, looking for gallstones, kidney problems, abdominal tumors, etc., obstetrics, and we're not talking about the ones that you get at the mall where you get the baby gram picture. We're talking about real diagnostic care that relates to obstetrics and vascular sonography, studies of blood vessels that are blocked or, or something's wrong. The cardiac track has an extensive focus on cardiac imaging. Both tracks require four semesters uh, to complete. Compensation, the same, pretty much. Other major areas of study at Weber include nuclear medicine, utilizing radioisotopes, which has a huge application in medical imaging, radiation therapy, treatment of uh, tumors, uh, et cetera, utilizing radiation, uh, cobalt, you may see big billboards for the Gamma Knife. The Gamma Knife is an unbelievable machine. Uh, if, if I had an abdominal tumor here, in the olden days we used just to radiate that straight forward. But the problem is the tissues in between get scorched, burned, toast. 
The gamma camera is a camera that moves in multiple planes, but the focus point is right on that abdominal tumor. And because it passes through multiple planes in the X, Y, and Z plane, it does not affect the surrounding tissues. But the focus is always directed to the area of interest. And you'll see that gamma knife, it has, goes by various names, but the gamma knife is the one you see mostly on the billboards. So you can get advanced radiological sciences uh, with emphasis on uh, cardiovascular interventional radiology, utilizing catheters, replacement of valves, uh, as was done with uh, John Fox, the Denver Bronco coach. His uh, cardiac valve, which was his aortic valve, was actually replaced without an operation, was done through his femoral artery. We talk about CT, we talk about magnetic res imaging, there are specialties in women's imaging, predominantly relates to uh, uh, care of uh, predominantly mammography and quality management. Uh, you're always required to uh, show that you are competent and quality management is a huge area. And women's imaging, as I mentioned, has its emphasis on mammography, uh, breast sonography, uh, mammography being uh, x-rays, breast sonography being ultrasound of the breast, and bone densitometry, as women are the most prone to get osteoporosis and osteopenia. Okay, I like this is where the, the emphasis of my lecture needs to be, the problem. There are seven to nine applicants for every position in medical school. There are 30 to 40 qualified applicants for the 16 to 20 medical track positions in ultrasonography open every year at Weber State. And I just checked this with Dr. Karen Murr, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Similarly, there are 18 applicants for the six to 10 positions open in the cardiac ultrasonography track. Similarly, there were 220 qualified applicants at Weber State for the 50 positions to become a radiology technologist. The waiting list was almost three to four years before you could get in, even sometimes when you were accepted. So I want to ask Dr. Kamamura, <coughs> Dean of Radiological Sciences at Weber, I said, how do you choose your candidates? And within a nanosecond, she said, quality, quality, quality. So how are you in this environment going to distinguish yourself from the man or woman to your left or your right or in the front of your back? Or how are you going to become one of the chosen few for whatever profession you go into? And this is where my sons help me out here. Suggestions, and I have four of them, and we'll go through those in, in length. And please uh, interrupt, uh, I'm not sure that's the word, please ask questions if you don't understand what I'm, what I'm talking about. The first is time management. Those of you that are sitting in the audience obviously have gone through uh, a high school or gotten your uh, equivalent degree and are sitting here and have already some aspect of time management. For those of us that worked it, or played sports, uh, it becomes uh, more prevalent. Uh, I didn't have those wonderful uh, internet games that are available that can just eat up your hours, so that wasn't a problem. I started, uh, when I got to college, I was, I must say that I had a little trouble in high school with time management, um, but when I got to college in pre-med, I, I s soon began to feel, not overwhelmed, that's a little bit strong, but I began to wonder where my next minute was coming from. And I didn't have iPads and iPhones, and I basically had a piece of paper and a pencil, and I made lists. And I made lists of what was immediately on the horizon and what was further down the line. Today I know there are one, many wonderful programs from notes that you can utilize on your iPad or your iPhone for time management organization to take notes. That is critical. I still make notes, just like the responsibility today to show up at 12 o'clock. It's not only fun to write them down, it's more fun to cross the doggone things off. So time management is the key. For those of you that are working, it's even a greater stress on your time. We're going to talk about something that I use. I'm a backpacker, and I'm going to talk about the next thing uh, that, that fits into time management and organization. So if you don't have a program that you're utilizing, then the old pencil and pad, 
about how you're going to organize your time. Which comes first? Which is more important? Is it the midterm examination or is it obtaining a date for the weekend? You've got to decide. Okay, anticipation is probably the one area that most changed my life in terms of time management and organization was anticipation. And how did this happen? In the 70s, long before the days of CT, I was asked to come up to the operating room to look and confirm uh, a, a child, uh, excuse me, I was asked to come to the operating room to view the operation on a child that I'd made a diagnosis of abdominal tumor long before the days of CT, which is much easier now. And I went up there and the surgeon had just come back from Poland and he was the senior surgeon. And as he was operating on this complex case, there were about 12 in the room, He's sitting there, he's operating, he's got the loops on, 10 power magnification, and he's operating, he says, and then we went over to this restaurant, and he held out his hand, and bam, the surgical scrub nurse had an operative tool in his hand, and he just went about with his business, he says, and then we went over to, bam, there was another operative instrument. And I watched this for about five minutes, and I said, holy cow, she knows his every move. Now, she'd been with him for 15 years, but she knew everything he needed. He never asked for it. She anticipated his every need. And not only did I get the abdominal tumor right, but I went back and sat in my office, my feet up on the desk like you saw, and I said, holy cow, I need to learn and train my associates to anticipate my every move. I need them to keep me out of trouble before I get into trouble. My focuses are on these kids that are the size of flashlights to the dolls you say. I'm talking about premature infants this big where my focus barely includes my visual, visual plane. I've got a sedation nurse, I've got a technologist, and I've got an associate, and I'm focused on this. And what the last thing I need to hear is my sedation nurse say, Dr. Jaffe, that kid is not breathing. Well, let me tell you, that's about the last thing you want to hear. So I said to myself, you know, I've got to train these people. It's my responsibility to tell them, Dr. Jaffe, don't tell me they're not breathing. Tell me 10 minutes before they get in trouble that this kid is not doing well so we can stop and head this thing off. And I began to train my technologist to keep me out of trouble before I got there, the anticipation aspect. And I will tell you that when I talk to my sons, particularly my, uh, uh, my son uh, who's the uh, investment banker, he said, Dad, he says, when you go to an interview in business, he says, if you are waiting for the question, he says, you are two questions behind. I said, well, explain that to me. He said, you need to know more than the interviewer about the position that you were interviewing for. You need to anticipate his or her questions and be ready with the answer that you have rehearsed at home already. You certainly don't want to be caught like Miss America up there on the stage and they ask you and all they can come up with is world peace. You need to have that answer two weeks before and rehearse so that you look like you know what you're doing. And I began to incorporate the anticipation aspect in my backpacking. And you say, well, how does that relate? Well, I've always taken guests backpacking. And I must tell you that they really struggled for a long time. We'd go out for four or five days, particularly in the Wind Rivers of Wyoming, or less so in the Uintas, but also in the Tetons. And I always asked them to bring their knife and their towel and their bar of soap to the campsite at dinner time. And it was interesting to watch them day after day, completely disassemble their pack every time just to find these three items. And I said, well, you know, that's, Dick, that's your responsibility. That's, that's wrong. You know, you need to train him. And so the, I also began to notice that no sooner had we stopped for water or something and we started up again, two minutes later, one of the guests would say, I need my jacket, I'm cold. And I said, you know, you can put this anticipation bit that you've carried in your practice into your backpacking. And so my sons and I, who generally go with me, formulated that we suggested to our backpacking guests to anticipate your needs, you know, 15 minutes down the road, an hour, 
in four hours and perhaps the next day. In other words, start thinking ahead. And I would tell you that that's going to work in your practice, whatever you do. Like before I come to this lecture, where's my thumb drive? Where's my laser pointer, which isn't working, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the anticipation, I will tell you, is an important aspect of your success in later life. Okay, critically, you need to develop unique skill sets. As my older son said, you can never be overtrained, and you make your own luck. Think about that for a minute. One of the aspects why I was asked to join the Children's Hospital is because I learned unique skill sets, whether it was in Malaysia or in my service requirement at the National Institutes of Health. And you never know what you pick up which may come in handy. Maybe it's your ability, particularly in this state, to speak a foreign language for those of you that have been in a foreign country come back on missions. Man, that is a unique skill set that is so useful in business. If you can speak Japanese or Chinese, let me tell you, that is a unique skill set. And that will get you a long way. You do make your own luck by developing unique skill sets. This was not available when I was uh, uh, in training, networking. The networking is critical. And I would tell you that you, to be accepted in this society today, you may be the best physician in the world, the best teacher, whatever it is, but if you cannot relate to your colleagues, then you are in trouble. As Hillary Clinton said, it takes a village. Medicine today is not one individual. It's everything from the dietitian to the radiologist to the internist and on and on and on. It is a team approach, and I would propose to you in business today, it's a team approach. You may have unique skill sets, but you need to learn to relate to your colleagues. And networking is a great way to, to do this. As I said, I didn't have this opportunity. And what's important, as talking to my sons again, they said, Dad, did you know that over 50% of human resource officers will look at your social media sites when you, even before you are interviewed. And so that brings me, remember, to have on your social media sites only, you want, only what you want others to view as you advance in your career. I would propose that a picture of the males hanging upside down on the freeway in their boxer shorts with a can of beer are probably going to kill you if someone ever sees it. What's going to work better is you handing out supplies in Haiti or in Japan after the, the tragedy there, or working at the food bank. Again, yes, sir? You're going to have to answer that from your colleagues here. I'm not aware of that. I, I think there's privacy aspects, but there's so many different uh, uh, social media sites. I think the one for business, correct me Rick, is LinkedIn. Isn't that the one that you want to be in? You want to be, you want to be linked in with your uh, business sites as less so perhaps with Facebook. For various reasons, I am not on Facebook. Uh, physicians, generally speaking, will not be on Facebook for, for many reasons. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I, I will tell you that um, the, the more unique skill sets that you develop and the more volunteer work you do, I would put those right at the tippy top of my social media sites. Yes, um, Joy. My kids <laughs> tell me all the time, remember what goes on the internet stays on the internet. It's there, indefinitely. Yeah. So you really need Yeah, no, um, you're, you're exactly right. Uh, something that somewhat related, but um, I would get that. I saw on TV yesterday on Channel 5, or was it 2, that a, a legislator was putting a bill that um, some inappropriate pictures that you may have sent to your partner can now be reposted on, what was the website? Uh, when you two separate, 
he or she can put these inappropriate pictures on the website and they're forever. So Joy, yes, you're right. Once those get, once your friends pick that up, it's no longer in your control. The picture of you hanging from the freeway overpass, uh, uh, once you send it to, uh, to Cody over here, he's got it and you may be able to erase it, but whether Cody's got it and wants to put it back, you know, is trouble. So it's, uh, it's your website and I would suggest that volunteering uh, and is a lot more valuable than inappropriate pictures of you uh, uh, intoxicated someplace. I'm sorry, that's just the way it is. <laughs> Snapchat, those like Pardon? There you go. I, I just heard about that. Uh, okay. So I'm open to any available uh, questions, but first, just to reiterate, time management, anticipation, unique skill sets, and networking, I think when you think about those will serve you well in no matter what profession you choose. Those of you that might be interested in aspects of medicine, I'm happy to answer any questions uh, uh, through Rick or whatever, or they're available on the website. So first thing you need to probably start is checking out the Salt Lake Community College or the Weber uh, State uh, Universe, Weber University now I think it's called, and less so in Dixie but mostly here, the programs are your first steps here. Any questions I can answer for you? Yes, Vegan. Uh, well, when you set up that you train people to know your moves, um, did you have, what was the most effective means that you did training for that? Like? I think I pretty much make, it's a good question. The question was, how did I train people to anticipate my moves? I basically described what I saw and said, um, that it was my responsibility to, to train them and the, any, way, or any way that I could help. You know, it's interesting, over all the years that I practice, one woman got it. She got it from the minute I said it. The others took years. But this woman says, Dr. Javi, I understand exactly what you're talking about. I've often thought about doing this or that before you asked me to, and I said, don't wait for me to ask, just tell me. All I, all I can do is tell you, um, Lori, that's, that's a good thought, but I don't think it's gonna work right now. So Lori oftentimes was 10 minutes ahead of me. Others, as I said, took a lot longer to, to, to learn that. Does that answer your question, Megan? Re oh, yes, that's a great term. I wish I'd used that. Pro proactive. No, it's, it's proactive, yes. Um, so, what do you think was the biggest obstacle you saw people have to overcome to get ahead in their career? And what is the number one suggestion you would give them? The number one, loss of focus. There's no, just loss of focus. God, there's just, you know, when I did all my training in the, in the uh, you know, uh, 60s, there were so much, there were so um, little. God, there were like three television channels. There, was, there wasn't Facebook, <laughs> you know, two, four, five. Yeah, right. there, I mean, my distractions were golf and occasional movie. I mean, good golly, you got social media sites. How many of you guys are playing birds or something, you know, on your, on your, on your, it just, the distract, it's, it's loss of focus. I will tell you that if, you know, if you can see, if you can see the railroad track in the horizon, you're, you got the right focus. And, and, and that's the key. Um, and you know, all these things, they spill over into recreation, everything else like that. Like I'm a competitive golfer, you know, the focus, the shot that I just missed it hit it in the trees is gone. I could sulk over that shot, but it's gone. I need to focus on the next shot. Just like the test that you may or may not have passed is gone. You need to sit back and say, it wasn't he or she that made me do this, it's me. I need to focus on the next test or the next problem at hand. Yes? So I have a question. So do you have any suggestion for a succeeding job interview, like any profession? 
I think I pretty much uh, summarized those, but I think the, the key, uh, as uh, my sons and I asked them, is that I don't think you're ever going to walk into a job interview without knowing the company that you're interviewing with or the position. In other words, let's say you're going to uh, interview for, industry, uh, for XYZ industry or whatever it is, and you have unique skill sets, okay? You have been, uh, you've worked your way up uh, through the ranks from uh, the mailroom to clerk, you're now in quality management. You can go on the internet, uh, you can talk to your colleagues networking, what is it about XYZ that is, you know, their major focus, what do they want? You need to know what they want before they tell you what they want. And then you can go in there and they can say, you know, I, have, I, I know that, you, uh, that your predominant export is to um, China. I happen to be fluent in Chinese. I have worked in import-export with, you know, for four years in Chinese. You, you'd be surprised that he or she that's doing your interview will be equally impressed that you know as much about them as they hope to find out about you. Yes? So on, on some of these positions where you're saying there's like 200 qualified and only 50 positions mm -hmm. available, are there any jobs in the medical industry that they're wanting more people, that there's not enough people? Yeah, to every, every one of those positions. I can tell you right now, that if you become trained in a magnetic resonance imaging or CT, that you can take that job around the world, and I mean around the world, and get a job within one day, unless you're hanging from that freeway overpass sign. <laughs> there, the, the, you know, nothing exists in a vacuum, and so, uh, the students today are smart. They know that, you know, what's available and what's not available. And there are so many jobs available in radiology. Mm -hmm. To give you an idea, why is that? Well, I was the third radiologist in this practice at Children's Hospital. We're now 14. You live in an area with, we talk about incidence and prevalence. There are a lot of children being born every day. Children's Hospital is now built out here in Riverton, another satellite facility. There'll be another one. I've been involved uh, as volunteer with uh, Planned Parenthood. You know, we started off with one clinic on 7th, uh, excuse me, on 9th Avenue. We now have five clinics here in this state and, you know, one in, in St. George area, et cetera. So there's one, there's, the medical profession is expanding as the population expands as, and as the technology gets better. So to answer your question, there are many openings. You just have to fight your way through to get in school. I guarantee you that once you're in school, whether it's medical school or technology, or college for that matter, that that institution cannot afford to have you flunk. They will make every effort to keep you in there. Whether you have a serious uh, learning disability, whether you're handicapped, or whether you have a drug abuse problem, why is that? Pick a college. Pick Washington University. It's interesting because I talked to the, the uh, 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 dean of students there when my, when my son went to Washington University. You have 400 to 1,000 students coming in, and they found out that a 1,000 students coming in, there's a lot of kids that are homesick. And they found out that if they could divide them into, quote, colleges or groups of 40 students and get he or she to identify with one other student to commiserate about how bad the weather was or how bad the food was, just to commiserate with that one student and you could keep them there for 10 weeks, you would have them for four years. Now, pick a private college with tuition of $40,000. I don't know, you know, some are higher, some are lower. If you lose $40,000 times four is $160,000 that that college is going to get per year. You lose 10 students, start doing the math. That college can lose 10 to 20 million because the students are unhappy for whatever reason. They miss mama, they miss papa, they miss their partner, whatever it is. Yes, there are alternates, but I can tell you that every, the, the same thing, a medical school has so much invested in getting you in, 
it's also invested in keeping you in. And that's the same thing. The trick is, is to get through the damn door in the first place. And that's why you need your unique skill sets. Yes, Joy. Is being a team player really important in trying to get these kind of jobs? Absolutely. And you need, you need to show that incentive, right? Yes, I think, yes, I think, Joy, that, that's something that's very useful on, on, on your website. Certain jobs, you know, more, you know, more so, you know, if you're going to be, let's say, a, a human resources or whatever. But most radiology technology positions, um, uh, you are working with multiple people. Uh, it's a, I think as I look at my, my son, my son, as I said, is a baseball writer. I was just talking with him today. Uh, for you baseball fans, the Asian uh, ball player Tanaka just signed with the Yankees for some exorbitant sum. You know, they're dividing up m themselves among six writers who's going to write about it. It turns out it's my son. You have to be able to communicate with your colleagues so that you show respect and empathy when, it, when it's needed. Hillary Clinton said it best, it takes a village. How do you spell your last name? J-A-F-F-E, Jackson, Apple, Frank, Frank, Edwards. <laughs> Andrea, any questions? Aren't these name tag these name tags are disastrous? <laughs> Any other questions I can answer for you? Yes, Jeff. Uh, I'm just curious if, if you had any mentors as you went through your career, and if you did, how did you approach them? In the beginning? Very good question. The question is, did I have any have any mentors? Uh, predominantly for myself, it was a bootstrap operation. Uh, my father and mother were uh, physicians. I um, I don't know. Uh, I probably um, uh, my father kind of directed me uh, toward the medical profession, but I always liked the sciences. I uh, probably could have gone to other schools on the East Coast, but I was, uh, had a pretty limited horizon and uh, uh, got a golf scholarship in part to the University of Washington, but I, I probably uh, could have gone elsewhere. I and my wife sent our kids elsewhere, out of state, with the understanding that once you send them out of state, they ain't coming back. Uh, but to answer your question, my biggest mentor was my senior partner in the practice of radiology. As I said, I was the, I was the third individual, and I had unique skill sets, but I watched how he practiced and how he related to other people, and I tried to model myself uh, after my senior partner. The second partner was good, but the senior partner was the one who, who really had the skill sets that I needed to develop. And, um, you know, I will tell you that in my, my profession, which had some very unique skill sets, I learned as much at the bar after the meeting was over than learning at the formal lectures and talking, you know, about how do you do A, B, C, D. Did you really do this? You know, the, he or she said at the lecture that, you know, you needed to do this, this. Is that the way you did it, Gordon? Or what's the real secret? So yes, your networking and everything else like that. Um, networking to me was verbal and not as it is today. Give me the high sign. No, I just put your suggestions back up. Oh. I thought that was so appropriate that. Um... Yes. Okay, please. so for like, if you wanted to get into medical, but more on the business side, mm -hmm. do you do you still have to go to like medical college? No, you you don't you don't have to. But I will tell you that there, <laughs> the problem is that there are killers out there that have done both. Mm -hmm. Just like there are individuals, and I can name a few of them. There are individuals who've gone to medical school, have not practiced one bit, maybe an internship, and then gone to law school. You do not. Those people that are in management, you know that. Um, Got to get a little tender here and be careful what I say. <laughs> doctors want to manage themselves, but doctors know squat about business. Okay? So when it came time, our practice was three. When we got to five, we incorporated. Okay? I did the books, learned how to use, do QuickBooks. Someone else bought the insurance. Somebody else dealt with other physicians and problems. And we said, you know, it's a lot better for us to hire someone with an MBA that knows how to deal with this than to waste our time. And so, uh, I, that's not a good term, waste our time. We did not have the skill sets 
to, to do many of these things. But we were, um, we were too small to afford a business manager until we got to be you know, critical mass and got a business manager. So most people that manage physician practices will have an MBA of some type. And in working in the field, um, uh, they, uh, they're adept. They learn how to respond to physicians and the physician's needs. Medical equipment cost millions and millions of dollars. Here's a note here about, someone left these notes here. Straight line, cost of assets minus residual value divided by useful lice in parentheses time. Doctors don't know this. We don't know how to depreciate equipment and that sort of stuff. So yes, MBAs work hand in hand. I can tell you the Intermountain Medical, uh, which is, uh, owns uh, uh, and manages 16 hospitals, has a ton of individuals. And I've watched these individuals start managing, uh, they have master's degrees, uh, and they may have got them from Phoenix or Weber or whatever it is. Many of them didn't go to Wharton or Kellogg or whatever it is. They came up through the local system, they worked at the Children's Hospital, and then they just promoted up, and now they sit in positions of, of great responsibility in Intermountain Medical Care. Time out. <laughs> Thank you for your attention. I hope you can remember some of these. I think they'll serve you well as they served me. Great job. Thanks. Thanks. A lot of fun.